Most economic resources rely on the void between the components of the rock rather than on the rocks themselves. So let's talk about porosity in carbonate, which is a complicated topic. Okay, here we are in the High Atlas of Morocco and the rocks that surround us are Jurassic in age. We've also done some research on them, but in particular we were interested in their porosity, the amount of void that you have in the rocks. And that is of course of high interest for petroleum or water resources. And porosity in carbonate tends to be more complicated than in silicyclastics, but also more interesting. And that has to do with the fact that carbonates can more easily dissolve and of course also more easily recrystallize or reprecipitate as new cement. So that creates a host of uh, challenges. It's also in part due to the fact that the grains themselves are not simple beads of glass. So you can have more complex porosity inside grains, outside of grains, etc. So we need, just like we did with the sediments, we need a common language to talk about porosity. So let's, let's look at this common language, this porosity classification. And the porosity classification we will use is known as the chocolate and prey classification. And here you have the whole classification, but I will build it for you step by step. So a key concept in this classification is fabric selectivity. The reason that it's a key concept is because the chocolate and prey classification effectively gives you an indication of how the porosity came into being. It is a genetic classification of porosity. So you understand part of the history of the rock. And for that, whether the porosity is fabric selective or not plays a big role. So we have fabric selective and not fabric selective. So what is a fabric selective porosity? I'll give you three examples. In this case, we have rounded ooids, and in blue, in between the grains, we have a porosity. This porosity is said to be fabric selective because it follows the fabric of the rock. Now, the fabric of the rock in this case is the shape of the ooids. But we can also have a case where the rock is here represented in yellow, the porosity in blue, and you can see that the porosity is effectively grains, skeletal grains that were dissolved. This is still a fabric selective porosity because the fabric of the rock is not disturbed. Even though you've dissolved the, the skeletal component to create porosity, that porosity follows the fabric of the initial component. So it is fabric selective. And if you recrystallize a rock, you obtain a crystalline rock, but now the fabric of the rock are the crystals themselves. So the porosity behind or between those crystals is still said to be fabric selective. So these are examples of fabric selective porosities. Now, to be not fabric selective, a porosity would have to cross cut ac across the, the fabric. So here are examples of not fabric selective porosity because it cross cuts everything. Let's look at some more concrete example of fabric selective porosity. Now, fabric selective porosity can be subdivided into two categories depending on when they were formed. We have on the one hand, fabric selective primary porosity, which is formed at time of deposition of the sediments. We'll look at a few examples in a second. And then we can have secondary porosity that is formed after the deposition of the rock. But let's look at the, fa the primary fabric selective porosities first. The simplest one is the interparticle porosity in between the grains. This is very similar to the typical porosity in clastic systems where all the porosity is between the grains of quartz. This is also possible in carbonates. In this case, you see on the left, we have a thin section with benthic foraminifers and the porosity in blue is indicated now with an arrow, and that's an interparticle porosity. 
But because carbonate grains can be more complex, we can also have intraparticle porosity. So here's an example of intraparticle porosity. You can see we have a gastropod. And here I will indicate with white arrow the chambers in which we have porosity. This is known as an intraparticle porosity. Now pay attention to this thin section because you can see that on this one thin section we can have multiple porosities. So we have the intraparticle porosity, but between the gastropod, here I'm going to indicate in the top right corner with an arrow, that we also have interparticle porosity. Okay, so both porosity types are present here. Another common primary porosity in fine grain muddy sediments is fenestral porosity. Fenestral porosity happens in tidal flat where you have lots of micrite, but also where you have a lot of organic activity in the sediments, bacterial activities that generate CO2 or gas bubbles. And these bubbles can actually be trapped during the litification process of that mud. And so that is primary because it's there at time of deposition and fabric selective because the fabric of the mud is not disturbed. So those black points that you see on this uh, example are fenestral porosity. Then there's also geopetal or shelter porosity where a component protects the rest of the porosity below it. Here's an example of a bivalve and below the bivalve you can see in blue here porosity that was preserved, that is shelter porosity. And finally, we have the so-called gross framework porosity. Gross framework porosity is when you have an organism that grows and in the process of the growth, it basically freezes or captures porosity between its components. So in this case, we're looking at the Grand Cayman and in between two reefs here, we have a large pore, a large cavity, a man-sized man cavity, which is gross framework porosity. Now that leads me to fabric selective secondary porosity. So remember secondary porosity are not there at time of deposition. They are always diagenetic. So the first type is intercrystal. We already talked about this. When the fabric of the rock is, the, is a crystalline rock because of recrystallization, then we have a fabric selective porosity known as intercrystal porosity. It's very similar to interparticle porosity, except that this time we don't have particle but crystal. So we call it intercrystal. And it's important to distinguish between interparticle and intercrystal because one is primary here at time of deposition. The other one tells me, oh, hang on, there's been a diagenetic process here because we have intercrystal porosity. And the next type of secondary fabric selective porosity is, of course, moldic porosity. A mold or a moldic porosity happens when a component is dissolved and so what used to be a particle is now a pore space. And in this case, I'm showing you some beautiful ooids that were dissolved and now instead of the ooids, you have pore space.